Um, today's session is um, entitled Critique of the Evidence Space for Oral Health Promotion. And um, what I'd like to do is briefly describe um, some of the evidence. So this is high-level evidence from systematic reviews of the effectiveness of dental health education and oral health promotion. Then we're going to uh, think about why that's important for us as dental public health practitioners in designing um, oral health promotion strategies or programs. And then uh, we're going to have a chance for some group work for you to actually um, see how you would design an oral health promotion strategy for a particular group. So we'll have a brief description of the evidence base. As part of looking at the evidence base, we're going to critically appraise the paper, the randomised control trial, and then do the group exercise. Okay. So um, we're going to. I'm not going to um, go over the theory of oral health promotion or um, that type of thing because. You know that already. I'm pretty sure that the Ottawa Charter must be kind of imprinted on your brains by now. And if you wanted to forget it, you probably couldn't. We've done it so many times. Um, so I'm not going to go over that again. And in this module so far, um, we've already looked at water fluoridation, the kind of prevention that you can do in clinical practice and community oral health promotion programs to some extent. So you've already had some of the background, so today is going to be about critiquing that and applying it. Okay. So there have been many reviews of the evidence base for dental health education and oral health promotion, and most of these have been systematic reviews, and they've been carried out over the past well, 16 years now. So I've just listed on here some of the main ones, but there have been many, many more. And they varied in terms of the, the criteria that they've used. So systematic reviews, the strength of them is, um, comes from the fact that they have strict criteria about which papers are included in the systematic review. And so they've varied in terms of slightly by the aim of the review, and the criteria that they've used, but, and obviously some of them are older and, and have older papers in them, but essentially there's been many, many reviews. I'm just going to pick out um, two now. Um, firstly, one of the first ones, which was um, Liz Kay and David Locker, this was one of the first ones that was done, and they looked at specific things such as interventions aimed at reducing caries, improving oral hygiene, improving gingival health, improving knowledge, attitudes and behaviours, and interventions aimed at altering sugar intake. So they searched five databases, they hand searched 94 journals, so that means literally getting the journals and looking through every single article in every issue of 94 journals and they also use their own personal contacts because they uh, were experts in that field to to find as many papers as they could. Um, the second one um, was a slightly more, uh, was done about the same time um, and a slightly more sort of broad aims about effective and ineffective oral health promotion practices. And they were a little bit less rigorous than the first one, um, so that more studies could be included. And actually there's a third one. There's a, I've included a more recent one, um, which is Richard Watt and um, Marino, the same Valerio Marino that did the fluoride, a lot of the fluoride varnish Cochrane reviews. And they were looking specifically at plaque and gingivitis in the short term. So their systematic review included five systematic reviews, 13 trials, 
because it was a more recent study, they were able to include more recent trials. But they, as I said, were particularly uh, focusing on plaque and gingivitis. So I'm going to summarise now all of the systematic reviews that have been done. And overall, they've all said that the quality of the evidence is poor. So the quality of the articles that have been included in the systematic reviews hasn't been very good. And that isn't something that's unique to this subject. Most systematic reviews do say that the evidence is moderate or of poor quality. But in this instance, the quality of the evidence at this time was poor. And while some of the systematic reviews and the interventions in them claimed to be about oral health promotion, they weren't. They were actually about dental health education. So the stuff that you've learned about oral health promotion and the Ottawa Charter and those social, political and economic aspects, the interventions in these reviews weren't about that type of thing. They were purely about dental health education. The evaluations themselves uh, weren't done very well. They weren't evaluated over a long enough time period, some of the interventions, which is important. They didn't include cost effectiveness. And they had very, very basic data analysis. So that meant that maybe confounding factors, they weren't able to um, control for those. And um, as I said, referred to the Ottawa Charter, there was limited reference to theoretical basis of oral health promotion. So it's essentially somebody thinking up an intervention, thinking they'd try it, thinking they'd give it a go um, to see whether it worked or not, perhaps not evaluating it very well, and then maybe finding it worked or finding it didn't work, but not based on any theoretical basis and not evaluated very well. So essentially what they found, and we have uh, stressed this many times to you before, is that changing people's individual's behaviour is very difficult. And that even if you increase somebody's knowledge, it doesn't change the behaviour. And we all know that about ourselves. So increased knowledge doesn't change behaviour. So any intervention that you design that's aiming to increase knowledge might increase knowledge, but it, it won't change behaviour at a population level. So there is no, from the systematic reviews, there is no evidence of the effectiveness of traditional dental health education for caries. Now, that might come as a bit of a shock to people, okay? Does it? Does it make you feel a little bit uncomfortable? Yeah. Because we think if we educate people, it will change their behaviour and they'll have less disease as a result. But there is no evidence to suggest that dental health education alone will do that. And, and why might that be? Yeah. If you have to change people's behaviour, you have to change their environment. Yeah. So, the, so the giving people dental health education, increasing their knowledge, won't change the behaviour. Because changing people's behaviour is very hard. If we want to change people's behaviour, we have to think about all those things in the Ottawa Charter: social, political, environmental things. So, education alone, te telling somebody how to brush their teeth will not work okay if it does work it's only very short term so i could get a classroom full of children loads of disclosing tablets loads of toothbrushes and toothpaste few poppets we'd have a lot of fun the children will be brushing their teeth it'll be great fun 
And that night, when they go home, they'll probably brush their teeth really well for their parents. And maybe the next day. But then the next day after that, they might have forgotten a little bit. The day after that, it's a distant memory. Something else is on their minds, and that's it. Gone. So my time, my hour spent preparing for it, my hour in the classroom, my hour cleaning up and getting rid of the stains of disclosing tablets from my clothes and my hair and everything else is, has only resulted in maybe a few days worth of better brushing. And if you were to cost that in, that the cost of, of me or anybody else doing that is not effective, cost effective, okay? So, from the reviews, so that's a kind of a negative thing that thinks, gosh, all these things that people have been doing for years in terms of dental health education doesn't work. But what does work? That's what we want to know for our strategies. Well, fluoride works. Especially fluoride where we don't need people themselves to do much. So what kind of fluoride is that? Water fluoridation and, well, toothpaste. People have to use the toothpaste. Uh, varnish. Varnish, yes. yeah. So water fluoridation and varnish, there's something that somebody else can do. It doesn't require an individual to do anything. With varnish, you have to be able to go to somebody to apply it, but day to day you don't have to require somebody to do anything else as one more or two more milk, milk yeah milk and salt yeah so those are the four things that don't require anything particularly toothpaste is the most widespread one but that does require people to remember and to be able to brush their teeth so the next point is that if we give, if we do dental health education and we do it to everybody at a population level, it will widen social inequalities. Why might that be? Mm, if you're giving knowledge to the more affluent population, they are more likely to adapt it more quickly than yeah. the poor. Yes. So if um, I had that classroom full of children and I did all the same toothbrushing to all of them, the children who are perhaps in more affluent areas may go home to their parents and say, oh, mummy, we've had a dentist at, at, no, at school today. She taught us how to brush our teeth. And then the mum would then say, oh, yes, let's... Let's get you a new toothbrush. Let's get some new toothpaste. Let's get a nice sticker chart. And we'll probably keep going and keep the momentum up a little bit longer. The child that goes home to a family where they have no toothbrushes or toothpaste and perhaps nobody is there to help them at bath time or their parents are both working or out or whatever, then that, that's not going to help them. So it will just widen the gap between the more, uh, more affluent and less. And the final thing um, on this slide is that general awareness can be raised by mass media campaigns. Okay, so if we have a television advert, or perhaps an advert on children's programs, or an advert on YouTube that's associated with a little. Uh, video clip that children will watch or perhaps something on the side of a bus or a big poster they can work to raise awareness but again alone they won't change behavior so what we find then is that a lot of things that claim to be oral health promotion our dental health education and dental health education doesn't work so if we want to do something that works 
we have to focus less on changing individuals' behaviour, more on changing the environment, social, political, economic factors. So while we can say that the evidence base for dental health education is weak, we can draw on, if we draw on the theory of oral health promotion and what does work, we have then got a chance of being able to find things that do work. And when we are trying those things that are based on the theory of oral health promotion, we need to make sure that our evaluations don't suffer from all the problems that the earlier evaluations and trials have suffered from, that our evaluations are designed to see what really is working and why it's working. So we need to think about oral health promotion in its broader sense. And if we are planning interventions and implementing them, we need to evaluate them well and we need to disseminate evidence about what does work. And one of the things that you perhaps have covered already um, in other modules and certainly comes up in the health promotion module is about the evaluation of health promotion and the fact that traditional um, study designs like trials are not always the best way of evaluating health promotion or oral health promotion because the traditional trial, while it uh, can assess the effectiveness, that's not the only thing that we're interested in when we are implementing those, those programmes. And the World Health Organisation have put out a statement about this, that the fact that, uh, that the RCTs, randomised controlled trials, are in many cases not the best type of study design um, and that they can be inappropriate, misleading and expensive. And that rather than just relying on something, single study or single focus like clinical effectiveness, which you might think of in a trial, you need to think about many other different methods to evaluate something properly. And these methods could be quantitative, sort of traditional methods, like a trial, but they could also have observational elements, so observing how people in the programme interact with each other and with the intervention. There must be some economic aspects to the evaluation. But also, uh, if we're thinking about oral health in its broad sense, and we're thinking about oral uh, health in terms of the impact on people's lives, then we want to find out from them. them. Because when things don't appear to be working, when oral health promotion programs don't appear to be working, it's usually not because of the intervention itself, it's perhaps the way the intervention is implemented. So, for example, uh, school milk. If you were to look at an experimental conditions of school milk, of fluoride milk, where you had, say, you know, a hundred children that came into your the university every day and drank the milk while you were watching them, and they did that every day, you know, for three years, you probably would find that that works. The milk with the fluoride in probably does work. But what doesn't work is when they have it in schools and some days the people don't deliver it or they deliver it to the wrong classroom or the, the teacher doesn't give it to the right child or the child doesn't like it so pours it down the sink or spills it and then when they don't go to school on Saturday and Sunday, they don't drink it, and then they're off for a few weeks having 
I don't know, tummy bug and they don't drink it and then they're off for the school holidays for six weeks in the summer and they don't drink it. Those are the things that probably stop the fluoride milk working. It's not the milk, it's the, the sort of programme in which the milk is, is used. So if you're evaluating something, just evaluating whether that milk worked in a very experimental uh, setting doesn't give us the answers we want. We want to know, does it work in the real world where the children are? And do they like it? Do they like the taste? Does, is, does it bother them that their friends might say, ooh, you're having that special milk. I've got normal milk. Yours tastes funny. Yours has got a yellow badge on it. Mine's got a blue badge. Yellow is like the colour of whatever. You know, that's the kind of thing that matters to children. For parents, it might be the cost, or it might be the fact that their children are complaining to them that they don't want to be different from, from other children. So those are the things that matter to people, and those are the things that we must capture in our evaluations. So we have got frameworks that we can use um, that help us think not just about the clinical outcomes, but about other things. So about impact on quality of life, um, have we managed to change the environment, have we man managed to get services more effective, have we improved health literacy. Now when we talk about health literacy, we're not talking about dental health education, we're not talking about giving people a few leaflets. We're talking about giving people skills to be able to take health messages and interpret them and imply them to themselves. And that's not just giving people a leaflet. So that model has been adapted for oral health promotion by Richard Watt. So if you were evaluating a big oral health promotion programme, you would want to make sure that your evaluation included these outcomes at all these different levels. On those levels, you can see by the words, healthy environments, healthy public policy, um, social influence and action, sounding a little bit familiar, sounding a little bit like the Ottawa Charter, yeah? So if you were evaluating it, you want to evaluate it based on this sort of um, model. Okay? So, I have just spent the last 20 minutes telling you what doesn't work. A little bit of time telling you what does work. So, what are the implications of that for you and for me because I'm writing an oral health promotion strategy at the moment for Sheffield. What, what are the implications of all these things I've just said for us trying to develop these oral health promotion strategies? So this is how we develop a strategy. We look at need and priorities. We look at what resources and support we have. We review the evidence base. We then think about what the needs are and then think about what the aim of our strategy should be. Within that aim, we set goals for ourselves, which might be about reducing inequalities. It might be about um, improving access to services if it was an oral health care strategy. So we set goals, we make a plan of exactly what we want to be to do and exactly how we're going to do it and at the same time we should plan how we're going to evaluate whether it's worked or not so when you're writing the strategy you plan how you're going to evaluate it just like when we talked about surveys we talked about designing the survey and design and planning how you're going to analyze the data here, when we're doing an oral health strategy, we need to do a plan 
And we need to plan how we're going to evaluate whether it's worked or not, whether it's achieved the aims. And then we implement our strategy and we evaluate it and then we review it. So those are the steps. So what we're going to do now is a little bit of reviewing of evidence base. So we've already uh, reviewed the evidence base for oral health promotion generally. But now we are going to look at a specific paper to review the evidence base for a specific intervention. Okay?